get started? Well, I was going to say in a couple of minutes, but we'll. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let me see how many people are on. Usually I wait for like 12 minutes. All right, well, I'm going to start with the introduction. Um, welcome to um, back to the uh, McLean Ethics Lecture Series, uh, Gender Equity and Ethics. Um, I'm just going to remind you where we are in our in our seminar series. We are nearing the end of the winter quarter. Um, this week, of course, I'll be introducing Dr. Sonali Paul. And um, next week, we are ending the winter quarter with Yana Gallen, um, who's in the Harris School of Public Policy. Um, we did have to cancel last week because of a conflict, but um, we will try to reschedule Dr. Kim somewhere else. Um, and then we're going to start take a little break and then start back in um, March on March 22nd with our spring quarter. Um, and then we'll finish out in, in May. So, um, but today I'm really excited to introduce Dr. Sonali Paul. She's an assistant professor of and a transplant hepatologist at the University of Chicago Medicine. She also serves as an associate program director for the internal medicine residency, specifically for, for diversity, equity, and inclusion, vitality, climate, and community engagement. Dr. Paul received her medical degree from Tufts Medical School and completed her internal medicine residency and transplant Hepatology Fellowship at Mass General Hospital. Her clinical niche is within non-alcoholic fatty liver disease from an obesity medicine perspective. Dr. Paul is also passionate about health equity, specifically for sexual and gender minorities. She is a founder and executive council member for Rainbows in Gastro, a collaborative group for gastroenterologists and hepatologists rooted in the mission of CHARM, community, healing, advocacy, research, and mentorship. Her mission is to educate the medical community on how to provide inclusive and safe spaces for LGBTQ identifying trainees, patients, and colleagues. And as an educator, I have really benefited from her expertise, and I'm excited to welcome her today. So welcome, Dr. Paul. Um, thanks so much, Dr. Euler, and um, uh, for having me and, and the invitation. So I'm super excited to be talking about, um, oops, sorry. Uh, my passion, really. So it's um, my talk is called Overcoming the Challenges and Mitigating the Disparities in our LGBTQI plus patients. And I'll talk about it a little bit from an equity, gender, and ethics perspective. These are my disclosures, but not relevant to today's talk. So in terms of objectives, I'll talk a little bit about my journey towards LGBTQI plus health equity. I started at UFC about seven years ago, and even before then, never did I think this would be kind of my life's work. Um, so things definitely change in career paths. Um, we'll talk a little bit about history, language, and current affairs about the LGBT community. Um, we'll talk about disparities, and as a transplant hepatologist, I did do GI as well, so we'll talk about digestive diseases and transplant, um, and then steps as, as to how to move beyond the binary and create inclusive spaces, not only for our trainees, um, but for our patients. So just a little bit about myself. So I'm actually from New York. Um, I was born on Long Island. I was actually born in Brooklyn. We moved to Long Island. That's actually our house. It's amazing what you can find um, on Google Maps. It's kind of scary. Um, oh. Okay, thank you. Um, I thought I was taller than I was. <laughs> um, this is a picture of actually um, from my white coat ceremony a long time ago. Um, those are my parents. My dad is a retired primary care doctor. My mom is a nurse. My brother is actually 10 years older and a cardiothoracic surgeon. Um, and so I grew up in a house that very much had a South Asian immigrant mentality. Uh, my parents came with $26 in their pocket uh, to the US um, in the 1970s and kind of built their lives from that. And so my mentality was all about hard work and education. Um, but there were kind of, you know, um, normative gender roles. Um, even though my parents wanted or expected me to be a professional, specifically in medicine, they didn't force me, but they wanted, it was very highly encouraged. Um, they also wanted to be, me to be a mother and a, and a wife and to take care of my family. Um, and it was very heteronormative. There was never any question that I would marry a man um, and not a woman. Um, and so being gay was not a thing kind of growing up. Uh, so then I moved to Boston. Um, and stayed there for a significant portion of my time there, um, 16 years. So I went to college um, at Tufts and then med school at Tufts as well. In college was actually the first time I'd come out, um, probably to like five people in my junior year. 
but it was the first time I actually felt like it was an inclusive space um, and a safe space to do so where I wouldn't be um, judged or um, hurt. Uh, medical school, I promptly went back into the closet because um, I didn't know. I didn't know what the, and even though I was in Boston um, at the time, I just didn't know there weren't many out LGBTQ faculty, um, certainly not any of my um, residency classmates were out. And so I didn't know what the climate was going to be like. I was probably out to maybe one or two people and that was it. Um, residency was much of the same. Um, towards the end of residency, um, maybe a few more people knew that I was gay. Um, I'd gotten engaged. Um, and then in GI fellowship, actually, my program director, who is actually one of my best friends now, um, outed me to the entire section. Um, and so looking back, that was not a good, I mean, then it was like not a good thing, but you know, we talked about it kind of an extensively. And I think I taught her never to do that again. But also, I mean, I got her perspective of like, you know, I don't understand why this is such a big deal because for her, it was such a non-big deal that she didn't realize why it was such a big deal for me because it was so, because her, the environment was so accepting. Um, and I got, I get where she's coming from, but again, never, I would never encourage doing that. Um, but that actually did help me um, kind of own my um, identity um, and be able to be out um, more openly. Two amazing things happened during my time in Boston. Um, I found my wife, Kathy, we got married. Um, then we had our son, um, Raj, in 2014. He's actually eight years old now and pretty much as tall as I am, <laughs> um, which isn't hard, I realize. Um, and then I uh, finished up my transplant hepatology fellowship um, at Mass General. And here I was out pretty much um, throughout um, and, and really had no qualms um, about being out with my life. Um, on the interview trail, I was very deliberate in bringing up my wife um, and my son um, as I talked about the job and the community that I'd be in. Um, and I have to say, not every place was very, uh, I didn't get warm, fuzzy feelings everywhere, um, but UFC I did. Um, and it was one of the main reasons, not one of the main reasons, but one of the reasons I wanted to come here um, because not only is my section, but the Department of Medicine, and I think the whole institution just very welcoming and I feel very comfortable um, being an out physician here. Um, and I bring up these experiences. And so this is a picture of me and my wife and my son um, with our mayor, uh, current mayor, I guess, um, Lori Lightfoot. Uh, and I bring this up um, because I've interfaced with healthcare um, in so many facets, right? As a med student, as a trainee, now as an attending physician, um, but also as a patient, wife and mom on a much kind of more personal level. And I think when you go through the grind of training, or at least for me, when I went through the grind of training, um, you know, I'd see doctors and I would be a doctor, I'd, you know, interact with doctors, I never fully realized the disparities that were in front of me because um, I probably didn't stop to look. Um, and it only became when I became a mom that I realized how much the heteronormity of medicine was affecting our lives and it was going to affect my son's life in particular. Um, and so there were you know, countless forms that had father written there that I had to kind of cross out and write second mom or mom. Um, going to the emergency room, uh, my son has asthma um, and even emergency rooms both in Boston and in Chicago, um, my wife and I are standing there and uh, they are asking who the real mom is. Um, and so very kind of um, not great, not great in interactions. Um, and so really, um, this was kind of what made me want to look more into um, what we can do as a community to make our um, to make medicine more inclusive um, for everybody. Um, so with that, I'm going to talk about history, language um, and current affairs. So just to orient everyone so that we're all kind of on the same page when we talk about definitions. So sexual orientation is a person's emotional and or physical attraction to people of the same gender, different gender or both. One can be lesbian or gay, bisexual, straight, asexual or something else. What's really important though, in terms of terminology, sexual preference and homosexuality are really outdated terms and should not be used anymore. Um, and then just kind of the alphabet. So LGBTQI plus, so a lesbian woman who's attracted to other women Gay is a person who is attracted to members of the same gender, although usually associated with um, men. Some women, like myself, um, identify um, as gay. Bisexual is, a person, bisexual is a person who is attracted to more than one sex, gender, and gender identity. Transgender is an umbrella term for people whose gender identity um, and or expression is different from the cultural expectations based on the sex they were assigned at birth. But what's really important here is that it doesn't specify a specific sexual orientation and transgender people can be and can identify as straight, gay, lesbian, or bisexual. Queer used to be used as a slur, um, but has really been reclaimed by members of the community, much more like the younger community. Um, and it's used to express a spectrum of identities and orientations, including non-binary folks and those with gender expansive identities. 
Intersex folks are born with different uh, people that are born with differences in their biological sex traits, including hormones, chromosomes, um, and anatomy. And plus, again, is a um, to identify other sexual identities not listed, um, but not in, um, including but not limited to asexual, non-binary, gender fluid, and pansexual, in addition to many others. And then just gender identity. So there's kind of two facets of gender identity. There's sex assigned at birth, or kind of what the medical community labels you. And then gender identity, which is more of a social construct of how you identify or see yourself. There's gender expression, um, how you want to display your gender, and then gender attribution or how others um, are perceived, how your gender is perceived by others. Um, other terms that we talk about, so cisgender is one, one sex assigned at birth corresponds to their gender identity and expression. And as we talked about transgender being an umbrella term where one's gender identity doesn't match their assigned birth gender. Um, and then there's non-binary where one um, doesn't identify exclusively as male or female, but again, is another umbrella term for different identities outside of the gender binary. So I just wanted to kind of bring up kind of trends that we have noticed across the years about the number of people that identify as lesbian, gay, or bisexual in the United States. So you can look here in 2012, there's about 3.5% of the population. Um, and then you can see in 2021, it went up to 7.1% that identified as LGBT. Um, I don't necessarily think there are all of a sudden more like a doubling of gay people. I think it just has become more culturally accepted um, and safer to come out and identify as LGBT. Um, if you look at the breakdown, um, the, uh, greater than 50% identify as bisexual, about 20% identify as gay, and 14% as lesbian. But what's really interesting, when we look at it through generations of U.S. adults, um, you can look at Generation X here in the red. Um, so born between 1965 um, and 1980, about 4.2% identify as LGBT. We go up to the millennials, 1981 to 1996, about 10.5%. But then Generation Z, it's doubled. Um, so not, those born between 1997 and 2003, about 21% identify as LGBT. So this is huge, not only for our patient populations that we're going to be seeing as adults and obviously in our pediatric populations, but also for our colleagues. I mean, there are going to be more and more trainees coming through the pipeline in medical school and residency that are going to identify um, as LGBT. And so really the onus is on us to make this space much more inclusive than it is. So just thinking about kind of discrimination in medicine, I think this has kind of set the tone for a lot of the mistrust that the community has um, against medicine. Um, you know, back in the day, uh, there were theory that medicine actually claimed this, right? That homosexuality could be cured, that it was seen as a deviation, as a physical problem. There was conversion therapies that were touted for a little bit. Um, and so this really set the tone for kind of the deep mistrust that a lot of members of the community have for medicine and provide and seeking healthcare. So Joanne Meyerowitz is actually an American historian. She actually got her um, bachelor's degree at University of Chicago. Um, she writes in one of her books, so in traditional medical histories, doctors often stand as pioneers in science. In the history of sexual and gender minorities, doctors, with few exceptions, lagged behind, reluctant pioneers at best, pushed and pulled by patients who came to them determined to change their bodies and their lives. And I really like this quote because it really is, I mean, if I think about kind of my life and I mean, I'm a physician, right? I knew I was gay since I was seven and came out um, as a physician and still didn't really, even though it affected me, didn't really realize it um, until much later on. And so that's just kind of one example of how um, kind of deep rooted these things are. So I just want to go through kind of the history because really to improve healthcare, I really do think we need to recognize lived experiences and not just of the LGBT community, really everyone's lived experience. But I'm gonna talk a little bit about lived experiences um, of the LGBT community and kind of go through the timeline. And so in 1952, the DSM actually considered homosexuality a mental disorder. Um, and again, this kind of set the stage for a lot of mistrust um, and not wanting to seek care. Um, it was thankfully, I mean, it took 21 years, but it was repealed in 1973. And a lot of folks actually think that Dr. Johnny Fryer was responsible for repealing it. Um, he is actually, or is actually a psychiatrist. He was practicing at the time. He's a gay psychiatrist. And in 1972, actually gave a speech, but he was incognito. He like wore um, like um, like a wig, mustache, like muffled his voice, different clothes, because he was afraid of what um, his speech of kind of. He talked about being a gay psychiatrist and what that was like, but he was still afraid of the repercussions that would have for his career. But Many people think that that was why a year later the um, the everything was uh, changed and no longer was homosexuality considered a mental disorder. 
and a shifting to government in the 1950s. There was something called the Lavender Scare. This was in the era of McCarthyism. Um, and this was when, when um, if you were a government official and identified openly as LGBT, you were actually fired um, because you were considered a spy and you worked for the communists. Um, so uh, a lot of um, government officials around that time either went back in the closet, um, not many were out, but um, if there was any question of whether they identified within the community, they were fired. Um, 1969 is when the Stonewall riots happened. Um, so Stonewall is a bar um, that's still there in Greenwich Village. Um, in the 60s, uh, police could actually go in and raid bars um, and arrest patrons. Um, and this one night in June, um, the uh, patrons uh, stood back in the, or rather fought back and the community fought back. And that really started um, the rights movement, the LGBTQ rights movement that we kind of know um, now. Um, going back to medicine, so in 1983, the FDA kind of in the height of the AIDS epidemic um, uh, had a blood ban. So men who had sex with men were no longer allowed to donate blood. Um, and this was revised a few times, once in 2015, and most recently during COVID in 2020. Now there's actually a, a requirement for three months of celibacy, which I mean, is kind of, I mean, people could lie, people could not, but I think most, a lot of men who have sex with men consider this kind of a, a lifetime ban regardless. In 1993, Don't Ask, Don't Tell happened, which was a government ordinance that said, if you were gonna serve openly, if you wanted to serve in the military and you identified as LGBTQ, you could not serve openly. Um, this was repealed in 2011. It took a little bit longer for our transgender um, service people to um, get the same rights. And in 2021, they were able to serve openly as transgender. Uh, in the 90s, again, 1996, um, the Defense of Marriage Act passed. This was kind of writing into law on a federal level that uh, marriage was defined by one, uh, but, but was for one woman and one man. So basically outlawing same-sex marriage on a federal level. But there were many states that um, allowed six, or had passed same-sex marriage. Um, I was in Massachusetts at the time where we were one of the first states. And I still remember um, going with my college professors and the deans who you know, had waited for this and they were getting married on the court steps, um, uh, on the courthouse steps. Um, and I still remember that being a very powerful kind of image. In 2015, um, the Supreme Court uh, made same-sex marriage legal. Um, this was a huge day. Um, I still remember where I was. Um, I was with my parents and family. Um, and uh, I remember feeling really proud. And I actually have this picture hanging up um, in our living room because it was such a momentous day um, for the community. Um, and that eventually became codified into law um, just in December of um, last year. In 2016, Pulse happened. <clears throat> this was a pretty monumental um, event. So Pulse is a predominantly gay nightclub in Orlando, Florida. Um, and a gunman went in one night, um, it was during Pride Month, um, and uh, killed over 50 people, injured countless others. Um, and it was considered a hate crime. Um, and kind of adding insult to injury, um, gay men tried to donate blood to help their community and they were turned away because of the blood ban. Uh, January 2017 to January 2021, there was just a lot of anti-LGBTQ rhetoric and a lot of anti-LGBTQ legislation, specifically targeting um, our, the trans population. And I have friends who are trans in other states that are um, not as friendly. And I remember them thinking of moving to more friendly states or just moving out of the country completely. Nope. Um, in January of 2021, um, the ex there was an executive order that was signed looking um, to prevent SOGI, so sexual orientation and gender identity discrimination um, from all facets, so housing, employment, um, healthcare, um, and that was thought to be a big win for the community. Um, similarly, in March 2021, so Rachel um, Levine was actually the first transgender woman confirmed by this um, Senate. She's assistant health secretary, and she's actually used her um, platform. I follow her on Twitter. Um, she's used her platform um, as an amazing thing to really um, uh, represent the trans community in healthcare. And I think that's just been a really great thing to see, um, especially now. Um, and just looking at 2023, just in the last two months, um, the ACLU is actually tracking so the American Civil Liberties Union is tracking um, the number of anti-LGBT bills that are being proposed in the US, mainly on a state level. And right now there's around 336. About a third of those are um, related to healthcare, specifically for trans youth um, uh, getting gender affirming care, which we'll talk about. So even though we've had a lot of success, there's a lot of work to be done. Just kind of shifting to medical education, um, 
when we think about LGBTQ content, um, this was one of kind of the landmark surveys. I don't, I don't, I haven't seen anything that's come out for at least undergraduate medical, medical education that's updated this, but they surveyed 132 medical schools. The average time that they found um, was about five hours taught for um, LGBTQ content. Nine schools actually had zero hours taught during the preclinical years, and 44 schools had zero hours taught during the clinical years. And only 11 out of the 132 had everything that was supposed to be taught in the um, topics. Uh, the most common ones were sexual orientation, safe sex, and gender identity, but specifically transgender health was lacking um, across the board. And so really, when we think about this, it really puts the burden um, not just on the healthcare system, but on med medical educators. Like we have to start right at, at undergraduate medical education. And I think things are changing um, slowly. But in order to do this, and this is how we're going to be able to reduce and eliminate um, or help reduce and eliminate health disparities. From a uh, graduate medical education level, um, there are very few studies that look at LGBT content just specifically for residency programs. Um, there was a uh, meta-analysis that looked at this and they only found about seven specialties. And if you look at some of them, I mean, every, I think this is important across all specialties, but specific, specifically if you look at endocrinology or OBGYN, um, in endocrine, 60% of fellows actually reported, um, only 60% only reported transgender related education in their training. Um, and these are folks that are you know, dealing with um, gender affirming hormone therapies. Um, and so that's certainly um, uh, alarming, um, not to mention um, just a huge gap where we need to go. Um, and even more alarming probably is that some program directors actually did not want to include LGBT education. They wouldn't do it unless they were mandated by the ACGME, which the ACGME has come out, um, not so much as a mandate, but somewhat. Um, so not surprisingly, there are fears and concerns about healthcare. Um, this was a survey that went out to um, folks that identify as LGBT and folks living with HIV. Um, just looking at their healthcare experiences. And there are fears and concerns across um, the board, across all communities. But if you specifically look at the transgender community, 52% thought they would be refused medical service because they were trans. 73% thought that they would be treated differently because they're trans. Um, and 90% thought there weren't enough um, health professionals that were adequately trained to take care of them, which is probably um, true. I mean, um, but again, I think things are changing, but very slowly. Um, and it's just going to back to discrimination and legislation, which we kind of touched on. Um, so this actually is the bigger map. So if you go to the website, you can actually see um, state by state um, what's what's been happening. Um, just looking at schools, and again, this is how much um, it, it affects every facet of society. So in March of 2022, Don't Say Gay was passed in Florida, um, and it basically prohibits classroom instruction with anything involving sexual orientation and gender identity through the third grade. Um, and it's unclear kind of now teachers don't entirely know what to do. There's a lot of confusion because if they're gay, do they not disclose that they're gay? Do they not talk about their own personal lives? If a fam if a student has gay parents, is that student not supposed to talk about their gay parents? So there's a lot of confusion that this is created. Um, and even um, probably even worse, um, schools actually have to disclose SOGI information to the parents. So if a student is um, has different sexual orientation or gender identity, um, they, they have to tell the parents as long as it's not going to result in abuse, abandonment, or neglect. Um, I don't entirely know how you assess that um, as a teacher. But some of the quotes that have been supported, uh, that are supporting this um, law. So. And these are coming from kind of state officials and senators. Um, so there's a concern, there's a big uptick in the number of children who are coming out as gay. So that's one of the reasons why we need this law. Um, and restricting discussions are justified because LGBT is not a permanent thing. Um, so a lot of just kind of rhetoric that's that's in deep, deeply entrenched. Um, so there's a lot of confusion, as I mentioned, and there's um, laws right now that can actually revoke the license of any teacher who violates the law. Um, and not only is this in Florida, but there are 14 other states that are looking into passing similar legislation. Um, so folks can also, just thinking about the dying healthcare on moral grounds. Um, so Ohio is one of the states that can do this. This was back in 2021. South Carolina just passed it last year. Um, and it allows healthcare providers to decline to serve if they feel like doing so would violate their religious beliefs. Although it's interesting because none of the laws specifically say LGBTQ um, people, but um, a lot of folks think that this is going to disproportionately affect um, LGBTQ populations, specifically trans populations. Um, and the uh, law in, um, in South Carolina is called the Medical Ethics and Diversity Act. 
Um, and the proponents say, that this is America where you should have the freedom to say no to something you don't believe in. Um, and so I remember when this came out, there was a huge, I mean, it was very, very upsetting, not only for um, the population, but also physicians that identify as LGBTQ and, and physicians in general um, that support the community. Um, just looking at the number of anti-transgender legislation that has gone through um, uh, state legislators. So in 2018 to 2020, there was about 19 bills, got up to 60 bills in 2020. Um, 2021 had 131, and last year there are 155. And there's probably even more that, that are going to come out this year. And these are usually bills that deny sports teams that align with one's gender identity and limit the ability of youth to access gender affirming care. So um, many of you may remember last year, Texas was one of the first states that actually banned surgeries and hormone treatments for minors. Um, I have to say not a lot of minors are getting these surgeries or hormone treatments, but they banned them. Um, and there are newer laws that are, they're trying to get passed that actually make it child abuse to even give gender affirming treatment um, to trans youth. It's a, and they're trying to make it a second degree felony. Um, and there are mandatory reporting requirements for not only healthcare professionals, but teachers and the general public. Um, 21 other states actually have similar bills that are um, brought that, that are being being brought forth um, at a state level. Um, and in Indiana, our neighbors, um, six days ago, um, this actually this law actually passed into the House and it's going up to the Senate. So in addition to don't say gay, um, it's going to actually force teachers to out transgender students um, at the school level. So I, I mean, I don't know why that's necessary, but um, the amount of um, bullying and the amount of kind of psychiatric illness that's going to come from this for our trans youth is um, just um, unconscionable. Um, and it's a shame because we know that gender affirming care is life saving. So if you look at youth that have gotten access to gender affirming hormone therapy, there's decreased rates of, rates of depression, thoughts of suicide and attempted suicide. Um, and now pediatricians who kind of serve these trans youth are facing um, harassment. They're getting death threats. Um, this has happened at Lurie's Children's. It's also happened at Boston Children's and across um, uh, clinics across the country. Um, and what's really interesting is like, I'm a transplant hepatologist, right? Like I don't prescribe um, hormones for gender affirming hormone therapy. I don't uh, do surgeries, um, but affirming care is so much more than hormones and surgery. We can all provide affirming care. It's um, affirming the, the person for who they are, recognizing their name, recognizing their pronouns, recognizing the way they dress and just kind of being with them as the person that they wanna be. And that is all really gender affirming care is. Yes, it is also hormones and surgery, but at a lot of these states at a state level, even this is not allowed to be just be able to affirm the person that's standing in front of you. So again, there's a lot of work to be done. So I talked a little bit about, I talked a lot about rather LGBTQ equity kind of in the whole society. There's also kind of a different lens when we look at equity within the LGBTQ plus community. And so when we look at within, um, and there's not a ton of research um, within this realm. There's a lot of sociologists that are looking into this. Um, there are lots of theories kind of floating around. So some actually, some folks believe that lesbians are more accepted in society than gay men. Um, gay men are more likely to be targets of violence. One study actually found 40% of um, violent encounters with gay men and only 13% with, not only, but 13% with lesbians. Um, there's also uh, this um, kind of thought that maybe society is more comfortable with lesbians parenting children. Um, for many of you that have seen the show Modern Family, um, there are two gay dads who adopt um, uh, a child from, I think, Vietnam. Um, and there's a really great essay talking about kind of, you know, is it are we laughing because it's funny or are we laughing because they're so inept at kind of parenting? And so a lot of the jokes, and I never really thought about it, but a lot of the jokes are kind of the dad's um, uh, aptitude at parenting. Um, and so it's just kind of something to interesting to think about that I never really thought about. Um, but this is something that definitely has come out. So there's a lot more high profile lesbian athletes that have come out much more often. So ones that come to mind, Megan Rapino um, in US women's soccer, um, and then Brittany Griner in, in basketball, who's actually the number one draft pick. They both came out um, at pivotal moments in their in their careers. Um, but in 2021, um, it took this long, but Carl Nassib was the first active NFL player to come out as a gay man. Um, and the NFL, for better or for worse, they actually um, were incredibly supportive of this, as were his teammates um, at the at teammates across. And so um, the NFL tweeted, you can be that person who saves a life. 
Um, and so I think this is so, so important. Um, and the more folks I think that do come out is um, you know, more helpful for the lonely folks in, in states that are trying, are struggling. Um, and within the community, as much as we as a community are trying to get um, equity, there's a lot of infighting, but not a lot. There is some infighting that happens within the community as well, um, specifically against trans, uh, the trans population and then also bisexuals, which can be kind of another lecture onto itself. Sorry, let me get rid of that. Okay, so a little bit um, about kind of the history. So I'm gonna to switch to kind of talking about disparities, disparities specifically in digestive diseases and transplant. So just kind of defining health disparities. So actually in 2016, the National Institute on Minority Health designated the LGBTQ community as a health disparity population. And so health disparities are really differences in health, health outcomes and access to care. Um, health inequities are a bit different though. These are when differences are a result of systems of oppression and structural factors that disproportionately affect and harm certain groups. And so when we think about health disparities, we really have to talk about social, we have to frame that into um, social determinants of health. So social determinants of health are kind of six domains. We think about economic stability, neighborhood and physical environment, education, access to food, community and social contact, and of course, healthcare. And all of these interplay and um, affect our health outcomes for any given patient population. Um, and kind of compounding that, we have to think about intersectionality. The uh, LGBTQ population is such a heterogeneous group. There are many overlapping and intersecting social identities. Not only, um, not only am I gay, I'm also a woman, I'm also South Asian. Um, and so all of these kind of come together also to contribute to oppression and discrimination. And then all of that kind of compounds um, health disparities as well. And so when we think about how are these health disparities created, um, the minority stress theory comes up a lot as a framework of thinking about this. So in this theory, um, there's life and environmental circumstances that kind of happen for everybody. There are general stressors, but when you're part of a dis disadvantaged status, um, a, a minority, so in this case, sexual orientation, gender identity, but can be across the gamut of any kind of disadvantaged status, there's um, a minority identity that emerges and there's proximal more minority stress that kind of is the, the internal process of like concealment, constantly having to come out, not knowing when it's okay to be yourself, expectations of rejection if you do come out. And then also internalized homophobia. There's a lot of internalized homophobia um, that can happen specifically when you're first starting to come out um, and even after. Um, and then there's more distal stress processes that um, include prejudice events, um, the social context that we just kind of reviewed, and then interpersonal stigma that can happen as well. And all of these, um, in addition to coping and social supports, which we know are decreased in um, um, the uh, sexual and gender minority communities, um, can affect health outcomes, whether they be positive or negative. So when we think about that, just identifying health disparities um, in this population is incredibly difficult. Um, for lots of reasons. So there's a consistent lack of data collection on sexual orientation and gender identity. A lot of the large public records to identify community members just doesn't exist. Um, I think things are changing now, but um, at least back you know, 10 years ago, you couldn't find that. Um, traditional research methods and study, dines, study designs may not be applicable. It's somewhat hard to do randomized controlled trials and, and think about um, data like that. A lot of this work is qualitative work, which in, at least in GI and hepatology is incredibly difficult to get published um, in our kind of mainstream journals. So if you are doing this work, a lot of the qualitative work goes into either sociology journals or more journals that's, um, related to LGBTQ health specifically. <clears throat> It's very difficult also to recruit LGBTQ patients. There's um, fear and stigma, um, discriminate, fear of discrimination, also stigma. And then still in some parts of the world, it's a crime. And depending on where you live in the US, there could be societal fears. Um, and a lot of the flu uh, the terminology is very fluid and changing. And so it's very difficult to operationalize. The terms I used in the beginning may be um, obsolete in one to two years from now. Um, the studies that we do have are incredibly small and non-representative. Um, and there's just a lack of grants and research awards specifically for um, LGBTQ health. And when I talk about this, I specifically think about kind of in digestive diseases, um, which is my um, home. So thinking about LGBTQ health disparities. So the top ones that we think about, so violence is huge. Um, there's a lot of trauma, both physical, emotional, and sexual. Um, transgender populations actually have the highest rates, especially, especially trans um, folks of color. Um, there's a lot of substance abuse, um, tobacco and alcohol, and again, because of minority stresses, 
Um, and uh, there's increased alcohol rates of um, two to three times more than heterosexuals. Mental health concerns are very big. So depression, anxiety, suicidal ideation. Obesity is more common in um, lesbian and bisexual women. Eating disorders like anorexia are more, much more common in gay and bisexual men. Um, there's increased rates of breast and cervical cancers, um, partly because of increased substance use, but also partly because of decreased scan cancer screenings. Um, there's increased rates of heart disease um, with increased smoking, obesity, insulin resistance, and then STI, so sexually transmitted infections like HIV, chlamydia, syphilis, and gonorrhea. And then also human papillomavirus. So there's an increase in, in men who have sex with men, if they have HPV, it actually increases the risk of anal cancer by um, 20%. Um, and HPV has been implicated in cervical cancer and head and neck malignancies. Just looking at the digestive disease lens um, and LGBTQ populations. So when we think about increased rates of alcohol and smoking, from, from my standpoint, you know, does that mean that there are increased rates of colon cancer or there are increased rates of cirrhosis in the population? Again, and everything on this slide has not been studied. Um, there's increased rates of trauma. So for me, I, I, when I talk about this for a GI audience, I, I talk a lot about the physical exam and how important it is um, getting that history when you're doing a colonoscopy and just for general patient provider relationships. Um, increased rates of obesity and um, lesbians and bisexual women. Does that mean there are increased rates of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease? Again, no one's really studied this. <clears throat> and just knowing how important a sexual history is because a lot of sexually transmitted GI diseases or syndromes can be very, very similar in symptomology as um, inflammatory bowel disease. So if you have proctitis from gonorrhea, it can look a lot like ulcerative colitis proctitis, but if you don't get that history, you can give them a salamine all you want, but that um, gonorrhea is not gonna get fixed. Um, and then there's increased rates of depression and stress that we know. So does that mean that there's an increased risk of um, disordered gut-brain interaction diseases, things that we think about typically as functional dyspepsia or irritable bowel syndrome? Um, when we think about our transgender and gender diverse populations, these populations have very much unique needs. Um, we have no idea, and, and this isn't just in, in digestive diseases, but just thinking about gender affirming hormone therapies and surgical therapies, there's so many unknowns, um, how they affect natural disease courses. Um, I think about the big ones in, in GI is IBD and cirrhosis, but also the liver is exquisitely sensitive to hormones. So does, how does that affect um, fatty liver disease and um, the incidence of hepatic adenomas? And then we know that um, a lot of the um, hormones can increase the risk of thromboembolism. So how does that affect our patient population? Um, and then we'll talk about considerations of organ transplant as well. Um, I just bring this up because I never really thought about this until um, I started doing some of this work. And I certainly didn't learn about it in GI fellowship. Um, so in transgender and gender non-binary patients, if folks get um, surgical therapies, they can get um, a neovagina. And how they do that is they, they take intestinal segments um, from the small or large bowel, and they actually create a neovagina. Um, but the question is, uh, there are post-operative complications that not only GI physicians should be aware about, but surgeons need to be aware about. Things like small bowel obstruction, peritonitis, fistulas that can form stenosis and prolapse. Um, and so if you don't know that the patient has had this procedure, if you haven't asked, um, and you don't know the complications that can arise, it can, I mean, it, it could be kind of, you're, you'd be treating the wrong thing. Um, and then also the question arises of kind of the incidence of colorectal cancer screening in these segments and how often we should be screening um, and again, there's no data to kind of guide any of this. There are case reports though of adenocarcinoma. Um, this is not, they're not, they're none in um, trans patients, but this is a case of a 76 year old um, who had congenital avaginal, um, sorry, congenital vaginal agenesis. And she came in with vaginal bleeding um, and had a vaginal endoscopy, but they knew about that history and, and she actually ended up having cancer and got it treated. But again, if you don't know that history, you would think uh, maybe GI doesn't have to be involved. Maybe it's a GYN problem. Um, <clears throat> kind of um, switching a little bit to organ and tissue donation. So um, we talk a lot about when we consent our patients, um, we talk a lot about the type of recipients that they can get. There are different types of recipients. Um, and one of those recipient categories is recipients who are at high risk. Um, they're kind of CDC high risk for infections. And those infections are HIV, hepatitis B, and hepatitis C. All the recipients get, um, get um, nucleic acid testing right at the time of donation. So they're all negative, but they have quote unquote engaged in behaviors that can potentially make them high risk. And potentially they're in the window period where they don't get um, caught. The, the DNA hasn't come up yet. Um, and so men who have sex with men is actually considered to be a high risk or folks who have men who have yet, yeah, they're considered to be high risk um, donors. 
And uh, while men who have sex with men can actually don't, they can donate um, solid organs, so livers, kidneys, hearts, lungs, um, with this de designation of high risk, they actually can't donate tissue. So um, vein grafts, corneas, things like that, and corneas are huge. Um, there's a huge push from the ophthalmology society to um, let, to get rid of this ban. But again, same thing with the FDA. You have to be 12 months um, celibate in order to donate um, tissue. So when I kind of, if you look at the data behind it, like does it really, really make sense? And so men who have sex with men are at greater risk for HIV, but this has decreased dramatically in the advent of PrEP. Um, and 89% of men who have sex with men are actually HIV negative. Um, and when the FDA actually looked at the data, their own data, in 2015, when they replaced the lifetime blood ban to 12 months of celibacy, they actually found no increased risk to the blood supply. Um, and subsequently, the ban was actually lifted in Canada. And so um, the ban here is still here. And I think the FDA just wants more data. So there are centers like Emory, and I think there's another one. I can't remember where, um, they're actually looking, um, giving um, prospective data, and hopefully we'll bring this to the FDA soon. Um, but, you know, it doesn't make sense. Is it equitable? Is it ethical? Or does it just perpetuate systemic discrimination and prejudice? So this is a 16-year-old, um, a, a A.J. Bretz of Iowa. Um, in 2013, he actually committed suicide um, after homophobic bullying. And in his note, he actually um, wrote that his final wish to be, was to be an organ and tissue donor. He was able to be an organ donor designated as high risk, um, but he couldn't donate his corneas. And so his mom um, says, I couldn't understand why my 16 year old son's eyes couldn't be donated just because he's gay. Moving on, so um, some of you may know the MELT score. So it's the model for end-stage liver disease. Um, basically, it is a reliable indicator of short-term survival in patients with end-stage liver disease and allows basically to determine who the sickest patients are that can get allocated organs. Um, the current version of our MELD score looks at, it's MELD sodium. So it looks at the INR, the serum, bilirubin, creatinine, and sodium. It can go anywhere between six to 40. Six is a healthy um, organ, healthy um, liver. 40 is someone who's in our ICU, um, incredibly ill. If they don't get an organ within a week, they're probably gonna die. Um, but there's been concerns that um, women actually in this system are being disadvantaged and mainly because of the creatinine. So there's the serum creatinine um, is found to overestimate renal function in women. So it can actually underestimate their risk of mortality. And so um, some researchers on the West Coast um, at Stanford looked at this and they came up with something called the MEL 3.0. Um, and in addition to all of those factors, they actually are, are advocating including female sex. Um, and they, in their models, they actually found that this can actually address the existing sex disparity on the liver transplant list. Um, but I mean, I was actually proud of the liver transplant community because a lot of um, editorials came out kind of subsequent to that to ask about what's going to happen to our transgender patients. Because um, we really don't know, the ones that have transitioned, we don't know how those therapies affect renal function measurements. And so we're just going to add more um, controversy, more um, disparities, and kind of more confusion to something that's already kind of wrought with disparities. Um, and so that's just kind of something that's, I mean, I don't, it hasn't been. Um, opted yet um, as our new MELD allocation system. But if it does, I know this is going to be coming up as an issue. Um, there's actually only one kind of series of case reports that I found um, in kidney transplants, um, looking at transplant and transgender folks. Um, this is a case series coming out of um, UPenn. Um, and basically, there were four um, recipients that um, the recipients were transgender, and then there were four donors that were transgender. Um, and I think the article actually did a pretty good job of kind of share, sharing their experiences of what the issues that came up, the anatomic considerations, the hormone considerations, and then also the psychiatric considerations that they had to go through for these patients. Um, in terms of anatomy, I think just from a kidney standpoint, like feminizing vaginoplasties and phalloplasties can increase the risk for anatomic issues. Um, they saw this in one of the donors. They had urethral strictures, recurrent UTIs, and fistulas that formed. Um, <clears throat> and then in terms of the folks that were on hormone therapy, you know, there's a lot of gray. There's no guidelines for this really at all. And so the question of what to do with kind of feminizing drug therapy, so things like estrogen, um, there's a risk of venous thromboembolism, um, especially with PO um, uh, formats. And so the question is kind of, do you stop them? Do you not stop them? Um, and kind of the time duration and the perioperative period and beyond. Um, vasculizing drug therapy, um, testosterone, in their study, they actually didn't stop uh, testosterone supplements. 
Um, and the question is really, you know, discontinuing versus holding therapy and kind of when, when, the guy, when should we restart them? Um, and we have no idea what the effects are gonna be long-term on graft and patient survival. Um, and so the article, I think, again, did a really nice job. And I think I highlight the psychosocial because we know because of minority stress and the systems of oppression um, that the trans folks have increased rates of um, psychiatric disease and depression. Um, and for transplants, psychosocial um, is such a huge aspect of having someone be deemed as a, an appropriate transplant candidate. And so I think working really, really closely and not just seeing their history of you know, psychiatric illness and automatically saying that they're not a candidate, but really kind of delving down into, into that much more thoroughly than I think we would for someone else is really important. Um, this actually um, was a case that not at our institution, but there was um, a high meld patient that had cirrhosis. Um, she was 35 transgender woman. She was currently on estrogen. She had been on it for the last few years as she was transitioning. Um, she had new alcohol-related cirrhosis, had decompensated. Um, her MELD was 30, basically meaning 50% survival in three months, um, or 50% mortality, I guess, the way you look at it. Um, so the transplant center said she was an appropriate candidate for liver transplant, but the requirement was that she stop her estrogen. And they really couldn't tell her when she could restart it, if she could restart it at all. And definitely not in the first year. Like, they definitely said not in the first year you can't restart it. Maybe after that, depending on how things go, you could. Again, we have no guidelines to help us with this. Um, and it really becomes really a matter of life and death. And not only from a liver transplant perspective, um, obviously if she doesn't get the transplant, she's gonna die. Um, but also, I mean, if she gets the transplant and she can't be her true self, I mean, that's also a matter of life and death um, for a lot of these patients. And so again, there's so much um, that needs to, um, so much work that we need to do just in the little realm of transplant hepatology. So there are um, also just thinking about uterine transplants. And so um, for those of you who have seen Danish Girl, um, this is actually based on a true story of Lily Elb. Um, she was actually the, one of the first people that got a uterine transplant. Um, unfortunately, she died of um, rejection infection three months later, but this was in the 1930s in Germany. Um, and we actually do transplant for absolute uterine factor infertility. So basically these are women with no uterus or a malfunctioning um, uterus and cisgender women. Um, in the U.S. and kind of globally, we've had 100 um, transplants in cisgender women with 23 live births, so um, relatively successful. But when you look at the criteria, so the, the revised Montreal criteria for the ethical feasibility of uterine transplant, the first thing that they say is that uh, the recipient has to be a genetic female. And so you've already kind of um, considered, uh, you've already ruled out trans folks to be even uh, considered um, in this model. Okay, I always feel like that's super depressing. So we're gonna talk about ways to <laughs> move beyond the binary. Um, there are really, there are a lot of things that we can do that are very tangible um, things. So I think education is kind of one of the big things and we talked about this. So um, AAMC has guidelines for under, undergraduate medical education, um, really focusing on um, integration of LGBTQ health related topics. So how do we do this through didactics, case-based learning, clinical rotations, um, and then also patient exposure and experiences. Um, I really thought this was interesting. interesting. So at Vanderbilt, um, there's a first year course that is called Brain, Behavior, and Movement. They actually think and talk about the neurobiological basis of sexual orientation and gender identity right off the bat, kind of in like Physiology 101. Um, and then Pritzker, I'm very proud to say, um, has the Health Equity, Advocacy, and Anti-Racism, the HERE curriculum course, um, and it expands kind of not just LGBTQ health, but across all of um, health equities. Um, and it's a really great course. Um, and so myself, Anu Hazra, and Scott Cook actually talk about um, LGBT communities and, and the health and um, well-being of those communities um, and, in a three-part lecture series. Um, and then for graduate medical education, there are requirements, which I won't get into, but there is a requirement kind of for diverse population requirement that's kind of vague. Um, and I don't entirely know if it's as enforced. Um, but at the end of the day, we want our field to be inclusive and safe, especially with 20% of Gen Z coming up through the pipeline. Um, a lot of these, um, a lot of that generation is, go they're gonna come into healthcare. Um, but there was a study that looked at um, in 2015 that 30% of medical students actually concealed this, their sexual orientation because of fear um, and discrimination. And 2015 wasn't that long ago. It was, what, eight years ago? Um, and if you look at just medical students in general, um, comparing folks that uh, students that identify as lesbian, gay, and bisexual, 
um, they had much more increased rates of um, burnout, disengagement, and exhaustion compared to their heterosexual counterparts. So there's a lot of um, work to be done just kind of on a safety and inclusion standpoint, just from a medical school standpoint. Um, and there's been, you know, it's really hardest for, trans, hardest for transgender and non-binary trainees. Um, transphobia and biases are very common. I think medicine, not only are we very heteronormative, we're very gender rigid. And so there's, you know, male, female. So the, the, the non-binary is not really accepted as much. Um, and this can lead to burnout, stunt professional development, and really decreased representation um, in our field. So the question becomes kind of how many sexual and gender minority physicians are there? We really don't know. Um, the AAMC just started collecting this data in 2017. Um, and they found that maybe about 5.4% of current graduating medical students identified as um, sexual and gender minorities. This is likely an underrepresentation given what we just talked about, the fear and stigma of coming out. Um, and there's really from a kind of a trainee and practicing physician um, point of view, there's really no large scale data collection. Um, so we don't know um, sexual and gender um, minorities in terms of how many there are and what specialty and where they're practicing. Um, and we know that there's an, a need for underrepresented minority and female physicians, um, but the question kind of in, in the LGBT community is, is that the same for LGBTQ plus physicians? Um, and of course, I would advocate for yes, but I think it's, you know, there are unique challenges because it's really difficult to convey this identity rather than kind of race or gender. Um, and there's a balance between respecting individual physician privacy and safety first the need to develop the LGBTQ physician workforce. Um, and so I think really there's there needs to be an increase in leadership um, because representation matters. And I've had conversations at least within um, hepatology and GI with kind of two very prominent people um, that are in very high leadership positions that identify as gay or lesbian. Um, and when we talked about them coming out, uh, they said they couldn't. Um, and they were very, very afraid that um, one of them was afraid of their NIH study sections, which I found so heartbreaking. Um, and I get where they're coming from. They're older than I am. Um, and they have seen much, I mean, I think when they were growing up and coming through the ranks, it was much, much different. I think I have had the privilege of come, kind of coming up behind them and having a lot more visibility. I mean, there's a lot more work to be done. Um, but I think that's been kind of, I mean, if I had known that there were gay people in, in GI and hepatology, I would have been so much, I would have felt more proud to be a gay hepatologist and a gastroenterologist until I found other people that also were gay in the field. And so how do we do this? So addressing implicit bias um, and not just for LGBTQ populations. So implicit bias, so they're unconscious, unacknowledged preferences that affects one's outlook or behavior. They're very much automatic or triggered without intention. Um, and these are biases based on cultural stereotypes. So it's really kind of what we don't think we, we think and they're embedded from kind of a young age. Um, there was a systematic review looking at 42 studies um, looking at implicit bias in healthcare professionals, none of them really looked at sexual orientation or gender identity, but they found that physicians manifest implicit bias like the general population. I mean, that's not a surprise, we're definitely human, but our implicit biases impact our clinical decisions. And so knowing what our implicit biases are um, and kind of checking them at the door, so to speak, um, is so important when we take care of patients um, and just when we interview um, trainees and, and medical students. So how do we create these um, supportive spaces? So again, collecting sexual orientation and gender identity data across um, both clinical education realms. Um, using gender neutral language is so, so important. So saying patient instead of he, she, partner or spouse, not husband or wife. If you're getting a family history, saying parent or guardian, not mother or father. Um, and then, you know, if you're pulling someone out from the waiting room, not saying like, or if, you're, if you wanna help someone, can I help you? Not saying, can I help you ma'am or sir? Um, and then having annual provider trainings, I think, um, that are dynamic. And I say annual, I mean, we have to do fire safety trainings every year. I don't understand why we don't do sexual orientation and gender identity training every year, especially because fire safety hasn't changed. This is changing um, uh, annually. Um, and then engaging in formal diversity, equity, and inclusion programs. Um, and then really, I think this is really, really important. So recognizing the LGBT community, so seeing the room through their eyes. We know that LGBTQ folks, when they walk into an unknown space, they're scanning the room to see if there's anything um, that 
symbolizes that they might be in a safe space. I do this and I didn't realize I did it until I read kind of that that's what LGBT folks do. Um, now my son does it. And so I looked for the rainbows. I looked for the HRQ sim HRC symbol, the equal sign. Um, or even if it's something as simple as just a sign that says all are welcome here. I mean, it's not necessarily gay related, um, but that's like, and for me, empowering enough. Um, displaying non-discrimination policies, including sexual orientation and gender identity. And then acknowledging events that are important to the community. So when UCMC kind of puts out um, their newsletter newsletter about pride and why that's important, that's that's you know um, honoring the community and the members of the community that are um, at the hospital. And then also trans transgender day of remembrance, which I don't think we do as good of a job as um, um, acknowledging. So epic. I mean, we have our epic storyboard. So now we can actually capture um, someone's gender identity, um, their legal name, their preferred name, their pronouns, um, and their sex assigned at birth. I won't kind of belabor this. And there's also, I um, mean, epic says organ inventory. We've been changed. We've been trying to have them change it to anatomical inventory. I think organ inventory just sounds odd. Um, but having this and kind of knowing, again, knowing um, what has happened to your patients is so important, especially um, in the situations that we talked about. So pronouns, again, a very simple thing that we can do. So pronouns and email, social, um, Zoom and social media. Um, it really, I mean, it seems like such a small thing, but it really goes beyond, beyond trans or non-binary equality. I mean, yes, it absolutely represents that, but it really normalizes discussions around gender. There's no assumptions. There's no misgendering. Um, it demonstrates inclusivity and creates safe spaces. Um, the most common pronouns are listed here. So um, there's she, her, hers, and he, him, his. Um, and then the more gender neutral ones, they, them, there, and z, z, zers. These are the most common. There are many, many others and many, many other combinations. Um, so pronoun badges, the Department of Medicine got pronoun badges. Um, and this actually happened because um, the pronoun badges, at least from kind of the medicine standpoint, started with our graduate medical um, education. So the, the um, trainees wanted these badges. They got them and then the, some of the attendings saw them and they wanted them. And so again, this is kind of how younger generations are educating um, uh, older ones. And so now um, there's opportunities to get pronoun badges. Um, I think this is also really important, especially for the smaller um, specialties. So uh, Lauren Westifer is a physician. She's an um, emergency medicine physician at Bay State up in Maine. Um, and she does a lot of research looking at this. And so one of the things she says is to wait to post match trainees and new hires on social media. Because they actually looked at this and they found that many trans folks actually use match as a natural point to transition. So if you post them with their kind of eros um, picture or pronouns, you might actually be outing them because they, they might be using that point to transition. Um, and so not only have you outed them, but it's really, really hard for folks to unlearn names and pronouns. Um, and so it's, you know, the the practice that we should be doing is actually when you can call to congratulate them or email them, actually ask them, you know, how they want to be, if they, if they want to be identified on social media, and, and if they do, how do they want to be addressed and what picture should they use? So other steps, just having inclusive benefits packages, um, different family structures, um, and policies that cover gender affirming care. Um, and then supporting out trainees and faculty. So having mentorship programs, again, there are very few openly LGBTQ identifying leaders in medicine um, and um, helping find community. Again, not all family systems were supportive. Mine wasn't certainly when I was going through training. My parents disowned me for five years. So I have a lot of chosen family in Boston. Um, and, you know, my residencies actually helped me and a fellowship actually helped me kind of get through that really difficult time. Um, there's family building and unique needs in the community. And again, not one, one size doesn't fit all. So like so, this isn't gonna apply to everyone obviously, but for um, it, might, may, it may apply to some um, and you can actually do a lot um, for that one person that it's going to apply to. And I think lastly, just be an ally. Um, and again, such a simple thing, but wear a pin. Um, I, can t I can't even tell you how, you have no idea how much it's gonna help. It can help a trainee, it can help a medical student, it can help a patient um, just feel a little bit more comfortable in the space. Um, and I'm gonna just end with um, talking about cultural humility. So we talk a lot about cultural competency in medicine, you know, knowing everything about every um, culture, that's not gonna be possible. I'm not gonna be, I'm not gonna be able to do that. Um, so I think more about cultural humility. So it's the ability to maintain an interpersonal stance that is other oriented or open to the other um, in relationship to aspects of cultural identity that are most important to the person. So this is again, very different from cultural competency. It really focuses, focuses on self humility, 
and rather than just knowing everything. Um, we're always going to make, and we're not going to know everything. We're going to make mistakes. We all make mistakes. I think just owning them, um, acknowledge, acknowledging them and apologizing um, is such a powerful thing, especially when there's a dynamic between patient and physician, especially when um, the patient is in a marginalized community. Um, and with that, I can take any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Paul. Um, so we'll take questions from the audience if you have any. I'm going to start off with one. I think being in the GME space, both of us, and seeing kind of the ACGME and their lack of clarity around it. And also, I think for me, feeling like we don't do the greatest job. I mean, I know that's you're going to take over and do better for us, but um, but like, how could we do better? Um, not only in internal medicine, but like across the institution for and then kind of influence ACGME policy. <laughs> it's not a tough question at all. <laughs> um, you know, I think it becomes advocacy, right? I think um, a lot of these things start at physician advocacy levels, and, and not only physician, but I think medical at the medical school level, where we have to advocate for changes. Um, the meta-analysis that I had mentioned, because I think a lot of people are like, well, I'm in dermatology. I don't know why this affects me. Um, and I mean, I have a slide on it, but actually, maybe I can show it. Um, so these are all kind of clinical considerations. So if you look through kind of all of the subspecialties, they go through why this is important, why it's important to know about LGBTQ health. And so um, like in colon and rectal cancer, so thinking about um, uh, gender affirming vaginoplasties and phalloplasties that I talked about. Um, and so I think if you think about this from a lens of this, and if we were to bring these, um, and even like right in pathology, like if we were to bring this to our um, graduate medical education, maybe we could make a dent in having more inclusive and um, more education. Doesn't answer your question. Yeah, it's like an inspiring <laughs> list. That's awesome. Yeah, Dr. Aurora. Yeah, really wonderful. Yeah. I think there was uh, a question that was posted to I'm going to repeat this. Yeah. Okay, so the people on Zoom, uh, Dr. Aurora was reflecting on our medical school uh, students and saying that there is a kind of a question of like, should all faculty get trained um, just like we are today, uh, you know, increasing our education around this area? Tough questions. Um, it's a great question. Um, so I think um, a few things. So I think it's not just, I think, from what I've heard, it's not just within the queer community. I think a lot of communities feel this way, especially first and second year of Pritzker, I think is very, I think Pritzker does it well, right? Pritzker um, is a very different environment. And then when folks go to the wards with um, attendings and residents that are very different kind of generations and weren't trained, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, I think, um, and it goes back to, I think, training. I, a lot of times, I don't think they're being malicious on purpose or it's exclusionary. I just don't think they realize what's happening. And so, again, I think um, getting more education from the attendings, for the attendings, because I think that the students have it. <laughs> they know what they're doing. They have the terminology. They have the education. It's translating that education to the older generation that didn't, it's not their fault, like they didn't have the education, but that's not an excuse anymore. We can educate um, the attendings and the community, the greater um, medicine and medical community, academic community. So I, I think that's where it has to go, but there has to be buy-in from the leadership. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, I don't know, are, I guess my question would be like, are those comments shared to leadership from like the hospital side? No. Yeah. 
Oh. Yeah, um, so I don't think web modules are, are the answer. I think, um, you know, one idea that I had had was to have, and it's, it's a lot, I mean, have a core group of physicians um, that can go to section meetings and do like a 10 minute talk on why this is important um, and record it and, and not make, but kind of make people listen to it. Um, Cause it doesn't take, it's not, you don't need an hour lecture, right? Like it 10 minutes, I think 10, 15 minutes, I think is enough to kind of get the point across and then do that every year because it, again, it does change, right? And I think also underscoring why it's important because I'm pretty sure if a lot, because I don't think the leadership may know, but I don't know how much of the faculty know that that's how the students and residents are being, are being, like perceive our environment. And I think if more faculty knew that, I think there'd be a bigger push to change. I'm gonna read this question from the Zoom. Okay, um, what can we be doing in selecting residents, fellows, and new faculty coming from states where LGBTQ care is minimized or discouraged? Should we be making sure that there is the expectation that those Patients will be cared for appropriately. Are there ways as an institution we can place pressures on states that don't adequately train their medical trainees? <laughs> um, that's a lot of that's a lot of questions. The first part is basically like, um, you know, like how do we deal with like getting trainees from state? Like, should we be accepting people who might not be accepted yeah. in their communities yeah. and knowing that that should yeah. be a barrier? Especially yeah, I mean, I, I yeah, ab absolutely. So I think um, I think. Interview, and I, mean, I think this is why the interview process is so important. And I think, I don't know how much on Zoom we're, we miss out on this, is when you visit an institution and you actually walk around and you see what we what you see. I have to say our institution, as much as I love it, when you walk down the halls, you don't see a ton of inclusivity um, that reflects our, um, not only our students, our trainees, but also our faculty. And so I think there are things that need to be done kind of just to change that on a broader level. Um, but absolutely, I mean, I think, if you, if you, if we get, and we're going to get trainees that weren't trained in states that had a lot, or it, that went to med schools that didn't have this curriculum, and that's why the GME training is so much more important, right? It has to come from every layer, um, and if you just do it kind of from one, you know, if you just think from a medical student perspective, you're just going to treat. Um, educate the medical students. I don't think that's going to permeate up. You have to do it on every level, and that's how you're going to create that inclusive environment. Okay. Any questions from the audience? Yeah. I'm just going to repeat it because I had the same question, you know, March 17th is coming upon us. The question is match day coming up for general surgery, internal medicine, all the specialties many of us post the pictures um, without asking. And so as we reach out, should we be asking for permission about posting pictures and maybe pronouns? You know, how does that work? I mean, I personally think we should. Um, and um, because the last, and even though it's not, it's not gonna, it's probably gonna affect what, one to 2% of your match list or of, of the class that's gonna come in. Um, it's it's just so important because I also think it sets the, the tone for the residency program and the environment that you're coming into, right? We care about, about you, we care about your identity and we don't want to, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, oh my gosh. We don't wanna, um, yes, <laughs> discriminate, <laughs> sorry. Um, you know, we, I think it sets the tone. So even though it's an extra step and it might delay you matching names and 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 um, uh, pictures like for a day or two, I think it's so, so important, especially, I mean, if can you imagine being that trainee that finish, finishes medical school in like May, uses that time to transition, and then all of a sudden their picture is out on social media with like their dead name um, and their old pronouns. So I can't even imagine what that trainee would feel like. Yeah. 
So I'm going to try to repeat that eloquent question. Um, so basically the question is where in the hospital do, do LGBTQ patients feel the most discrimination? And then um, kind of a general um, experience of maybe coming less from surgery or trainees that have had training versus like our staff that might not have the same training. Would that be a good summary? Yeah. Um, that's a great question. So I think one thing is that it, I don't think there's any one part of the hospital that has increased discrimination against LGBTQ folks. I feel like, you know, LGBT, the, you, the hospitals get one chance, right? There's one thing that happens that um, makes patients feel not safe, LGBTQ folks not feel safe or feel targeted. I think that's it. And for the patients that have the opportunities and privilege to be able to find another institution to go to, I think it's great for them. But the folks that don't, I think just have to kind of muddle through and kind of accept these things, right? And so a great example, I mean, I, I went to an institution and I had to fill out, I think it was like 12 pages of paperwork and every single line had something about a husband, right? It was wife, husband, wife, husband. And I finally just gave up. I was like, I'm not going to do this. And I didn't, like, didn't seek care there. But again, I have that privilege to be able to do that. And that's like, I hadn't even met anyone in the hospital yet. Um, and so I think it can happen really anywhere. And I don't, and, and I think that speaks to your point. It's not just physicians that need to be trained. It is anyone that interfaces, like the valet folks, the nurses, the, the cafeteria folks, everyone needs that training. And it's obviously different training on different levels. And, and, and the things that you talk about are going to be different. But if, I don't think if you, again, if you train all the physicians, but then, you know, my um, endoscopy techs don't know pronouns, then I haven't, I mean, that patient's still going to feel marginalized. All right, I think just there's a couple more questions that I'll show you, but I think for time we'll wrap up. Um, so thank you all for participating and um, we'll stop the recording, ask the um, ethics fellows to come down to the front and continue our more personal discussion up here. So thank you, Dr. Paul, one more round of applause.